This is very exciting. Hi, I'm Dale Peterson, and welcome to the Unsolicited Response Show. Before I get to my interview, I just wanted to let you know that S4 X22 tickets go on sale on September 1st. That's for our big event in Miami South Beach. See the background behind me. Uh, in every January, uh, it draws 500 to 1,000 of the top ICS security professionals in the world. And if you want to see what's happening in the future, you need to be there. So tickets go on sale September 1st. The way we sell our tickets is they're sold by block. So block one through 100 is at the lowest price, 1495 plus tax for three days, three stages, everything, social events and all. Those go on sale on September 1st. And when we hit ticket 101, then we raise the price and so on and so on. But because we know people are all over the world, it's not necessarily fair. What we do is we keep that ticket one price available for the first 36 hours. So if you want the best price on S4 tickets, you want to buy your ticket on September 1st. I'd also tell you that I know a lot of you are concerned about, well, what happens if I can't travel there or there's some COVID issue or that. If you go to that link you see there, s4xevents.com slash tickets, or go to the site and click on the tickets link, you'll see our COVID policy. Um, it's, it's very flexible. You can cancel 100% refund 60 days. I think it's a 90% refund 30 days and even a 50% refund 15 days. And if for any reason there's government restrictions that make it so you can't travel, uh, you get your full refund. So the idea here is if you can't make it, uh, we want to get you your money back. So you'll see all that information on that site. And you'll also see the, the great news that because we hold it in Miami South Beach, all the social events are outdoors, lunch is outdoors. We, we're in huge venues. If we need to spread out, we can. So I'm very optimistic that we're going to have an in-person S4X22. And I really think if you're watching this, there's a good chance you should be there. If you're interested in getting the best price, go to s4xevents.com on September 1st, and there'll be a big button to register on the main site. Get your ticket, and we'll see you down in Miami, South Beach in January. Now to the show. Joining me on the Unsolicited Response Show is Edgar Capdeville. He is the CEO of Nozomi Networks. Welcome to the show, Edgar. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you, Dale, for having me. Well, I had to have you on because you are now, Nozomi Networks is now the third company in the visibility and detection space that has a nine-figure raise with your $100 million Series D round that uh, you announced this August. So first of all, congratulations to you and the team for doing this. Obviously, there are people out there that think Nozomi Networks is worth a lot of money. So that's a major accomplishment for you and the team over the last five years. Thank you. Uh, it, I, I am um, fortunately or unfortunately the person that usually uh, gets congratulated. I, uh, to your point, it does take a village. Um, we have a fantastic team, um, folks uh, that, are, that are you know selling our products or developing our products or, or making our customers successful, all have contributed to Nozomi's uh, success. And uh, yes, um, I think you're correct. Um, at, at least some people think that Nozomi is a valuable investment going forward. Well, I want to get into that a little bit, but you, you mentioned the team. How big are you now? How About how many employees do you have now? We are approaching the, the 200 number. Okay. That, actually, I thought you would have been bigger. That's that's quite an accomplishment to, to raise $100 million at that size. That's, that's really something. I'm really impressed by yourselves and some of the others. Uh, you probably saw, I don't know if you heard secondhand, but I was getting, since I follow this market, I write on this market, I was getting so many people writing me, emailing me, DM, DMing me, talking to me saying, Nozomi's going to get acquired. And I, you know, the rumors were so much, I, I didn't say that I knew it, but I was, I think I reported a couple of times that there were just so many rumors out there. And I, I think the two biggest ones I heard were Honeywell and IBM. But I guess the question would be, you certainly could have been acquired. I'm sure there were many people that would have been interested in acquiring 
Nozomi. Why did you decide to continue to go down this route of, of raising money as opposed to saying this is the time to move forward and, and get acquired? That's a, that's a good question. Um, we, we believe that there, there are certain uh, things that we believe about this market. We believe this market is eventually going to be very, very large. Um, okay. I come from IT security, my, my background. I did not grow up in OT. Um, so, you know, in IT security, we tend to say that any one of the segments or neighborhoods of IT security, with the exception of possibly three, are, are very small. And uh, when you look at, you know, endpoint security is probably a big one. It, support, it supports multiple public companies. Uh, the next generation firewall category roughly is also a, a big one. Um, what did I say? Endpoint, next generation firewall, and maybe the SIM category uh, supports mm -hmm. a few public companies. Um, all of the categories, all the, you know, 100 other categories um, are, are not, are fairly small and very specialized. And every category has a lot of players. So I refer to it as the land of fragmented, fragmented neighborhoods where all the neighborhoods are, are very crowded. You and I go to RSA whenever RSA is happening and we see over 300 companies, um, mm -hmm. um, you know. When, when you change the channel to OT security, um, you know, our category, you know, includes significant vulnerability management, significant anomaly detection, significant asset inventory and asset management. Mm -hmm. um, so we've already expanded what the for, from equivalent categories from from the IT security world. So we haven't we don't have that demarcation that IT security has. Um, the whole product for for Nozomi is bigger than the equivalent product in IT security. Uh, we do have competitors and they're formidable, um, but but the numbers are different um, in, in OT. Uh, our competitors uh, make us better, so we're very thankful for them. Um, but we don't have, it's not like it's hyper crowded, especially now. The market, I think, without saying anything that is out of school, I think the market has has honed in on, on the leading three vendors. And... Um, and we're very, very happy uh, that we have accomplished this much. And we believe there is room for, for more than one. And we believe that at least one can be a fundamental transformative company for, for digital transformation from the lens of, of OTIOT. We want to be that company. Um, and um, I don't know. That, I think that's a fantastic yeah. once in a lifetime opportunity. And yeah. And uh, we, why would you go out too early? <laughs> no, that's, you know, it's it's one of those things where it's uh, a tough decision, I'm sure. I, you said something there that was really interesting to me, though. You, you talk about the fragmentation in IT. And we've seen in many, many cases, OT has followed IT with like a 10 or 15 year gap. Right. But based on your answer, it sounds like you don't expect as much fragmentation in OT. Like you could you could make the argument, well, this happened in IT, so vulnerability management is going to be different than asset management, which is going to be different than anomaly detection as opposed to doing all three in one product. I, I don't I'm guessing based on your answer, you don't believe that's going to happen. Why do you think it'll be different? That's correct. I think if you, uh, I don't want to get too, too, um, you know, far out there, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, the model I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think of a model that, that would make sense. The model that, that would make sense is think of it as, you know, evolutionary biology. In evolutionary biology, if you take a species and that species evolves slowly over time to its environment, uh, which is the case for IT security. IT security has yeah. evolved over the last 40, 50 years uh, to in increasing number of threats, specialization, investment, um, tons of ideas, tons of companies, and, and specialization has happened. And it's very hard today to do two things well. You can't be a CASB company and then also do vulnerabilities or also do something else. It's my, my former employer, um, you know, struggled and, and was very seen by various investors as, as separate companies kind of duct taped together. Mm. Uh, you don't have the economies of scale. The buyers specialize as well. Um, if you look at the IT security um, buyers and the organizations that we sell to, they have specialized. They have different groups within IT security. Um, OT security, from an evolutionary biology perspective, is, has to go through the same evolution, but much, much faster without, without time to, 
to specialize, to, to have years of, of understanding what the requirements are, build an organization and split them up, let the budgets grow uh, outside of organic growth. So um, I do believe that um, we, do, we won't have that much fragmentation. Um, the, the pressure on OT security, you know, as we have all seen this, this past eight to 12 months has, has increased dramatically. Mm-hmm. When would you I mean, think about it, Dale, do you imagine you and I having beers two years ago, do you, do you think we could have entertained a conversation where president Biden was talking about industrial control networks? <laughs> or, or senators are saying you need two factor authentication. I mean, that's, that's the one that blew my mind. Well, let me ask you just one more question. Oh, actually, I actually had two other quick questions on, on the raise. Uh, the one is that really struck my, you know, or got my attention was it was quote called a pre IPO funding round. Now, I guess you could say anything, any round is pre IPO, right? Everything happens before the IPO, but I don't usually see that in there. Is, is that indicative of the fact that you think you'll go from this round to IPO or does it mean something else? One of the things that we, we do at Nozomi when it, when it, it, you know, when it comes to looking and, and, and planning for the future and executing for the future is just to try to be well positioned. We cannot predict what's going to happen, what's the next COVID-19 or credit crisis is going to be. I certainly will not even venture to guess whether the IPO window is going to be as wide open as it is today. Um, so what we meant by pre-IPO round was really to, to signal that uh, we understand what the metrics for an IPO are. Uh, and we believe with the current amount of funding, we will reach those metrics. We want to have IPO uh, optionality and having IPO optionality changes the game, changes the fundraising game. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we want to make sure we we achieve those metrics. If we do a direct listing and a traditional IPO, a SPAC, we get a whatever the outcome is, you know, we obviously do what, what's best for our shareholders. IPO optionality uh, changes the game. Um and, and that's what, you know, we think we can achieve with, with this round. And that's what we wanted to uh, signal. Okay. No, that's, that's very helpful. That, that explains it well. The, the other quick question was, I noticed that Energize Ventures led the last two major rounds. Your C round was kind of small, but your, your larger A and B rounds. And then the Series D had Triangle Peak Partners. Uh, it's not unheard of to change your, kind of your lead investor, but it, it's not, I wouldn't say it's a common thing. A lot of times they carry along. Why, what was the driving force behind the, the I don't change know that. who led the round? Yeah, yeah. I, let, let's go back and, and look at, at those. I, I, I'm going to, I think there's a couple of items there that may not be accurate. So, okay. No, no worries. No worries. Our, our Series yeah. A uh, was was led by GGV Capital and, and uh, Lux Capital. Okay. Uh, our Series B was uh, led by uh, Energize. Mm-hmm. Um, our Series C was actually led by our very much our original investor in the company, the very first institutional money when our company, you may remember our company has, has European origins. Mm-hmm. So this was a Planven uh, investments, the Planven Entrepreneurial Fund led our Series uh, C and Triangle Peak uh, led our, our Series D. So so each of the rounds has been increasing in value. We, we didn't have a, yeah. a small prior series. Every round has been bigger than the prior. And um, and the lead investors have always been different. They have always been financial investors. We try to keep our, our fundraising, our funding, our, our financial uh, profile uh, as clean as possible. Okay. Now, maybe the, the most fun question related to the rate fundraising is, what are you going to do with all that money? What's, That's a great what's question. Re- why'd you raise it? What are you going to do with it? Um, I, I've made a couple of jokes. Some, some people find my jokes funny. Um, Ferraris and Lamborghinis. No. Um, so, so I believe, uh, you know, in any one company, uh, there are really only two jobs and there are no more jobs in, in companies like Nozomi. Either you are developing fantastic products for our customers or you're selling fantastic products to our customers. Every job has to be associated with those either directly or in a supporting role. And I include myself. Um, it's very, uh, I, you know, everything I do, I, I just try to associate which one of the two am I doing. Um, so those are the two things that we're going to invest. We're going to continue to expand the, the product functionality, product portfolio um, by, by 
target uh, segment. Um, as you may know, um, Nozomi has been fair, fairly horizontal uh, since day one. Uh, we've had utility companies, oil and gas companies, pharmaceutical companies, um, smart city companies, manufacturing companies, all from day one. And we've also been from day one fairly global. Uh, our first you know, big customer was European. Our second big customer was um, Asian. Our third big customer was South American. Um, so um, we, we want to make sure that our product continue to be uh, applicable to the entire OT spectrum. Um, and, and of course, we want to expand. Um, we want to continue our growth. So we want mm -hmm. to expand our, our go to market, our, our current go to market, which is primarily through our partners, uh, influence direct and, and, and then leveraging the partner community. I think you may have seen that we launched our brand new MSSP program. We believe, you know, one of the trends that just like you mentioned, one of the trends in IT that OT follows is, you know, the main market of IT security tends to be followed by the MSSP market for, for IT security. Um, we believe that that now it's, it's we're doing it enough in advance so that when the MSSP market for OT security is readier, um, we're going to have a solution there. Um, so, so yeah, expanding our go to market both in 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 you know, geo uh, um, mode, if you will, is the other way that we are going to deploy the capital. Okay. I have a few questions on that, but I want to, before we get to the future, I want to maybe just take like five minutes and look back because you joined, let's see, you joined this in 2016. So you've been there almost five years now as CEO. That's right. Uh, and quite a run, quite a run. Uh, <laughs> you really, really uh, should be proud of that. Uh, it's amazing how fast that market has grown. Uh, but can you look back through those five years? Maybe let's start with the upside. Was there something that happened over those five years that just took you completely by surprise? You said, oh, I thought it was going to go this way, but this happened and it was a tremendous, tremendous win for the company on the upside. I think, uh, I think this is, I've become more convinced over time, uh, both for career and, you know, another aspect of, of me, myself, is that I, I'm also a, a fairly active investor. Um, in a prior life, maybe too many years ago, I, I actually had a short stint in in as an as a professional investor, mm -hmm. um, and and I realized I've heard it over and over, but this is the first time where I can really really be a witness to it. The one factor that is the most important factor in a success of any venture, you know, a lot of people would like to say that it is the team or it is the product mm -hmm. or maybe the first customer. And it isn't. It's market timing. So, mm. so I've gotten market timing bad before. I've been too early in a in a prior company um, that was doing cloud storage before the term cloud storage even existed. Um, we were way too early, and the company failed. Um, I think everybody knows, you know, the being too late. But perfect timing is is amazing. I, you, I mean, you're familiar with the prior generation of products before mm. the, the current, you know, class, um, you know. Industrial Defender, Tofino, um, World Tech, mm. they were way too early. There was no market back then. Um, so so the biggest upside has been, and I remember the conversation that we had with our Series A investors, our, our, our thesis for the Series A was waiting for the, the elbow the, of that hockey stick, not mm -hmm. to do more, do less, just, just we are here to find that elbow. And, and we found it at the end of our Series A, we were able to raise a Series B and that, that's been the biggest upside for, for all of us, not just Nozomi. Yeah, I, I can attest to being early. I'm always early. That's why I don't, that's why I don't do the product business anymore. I think my uh, anomaly detection IDS signatures came out in 2006, which was just a little too early. <laughs> but now let's flip this. Uh, so you've been there five years. What was something that you expected to happen that you said, okay, this is going to happen uh, you kind of built a strategy. Obviously, it didn't sink you. The company's doing very well. But it, is there anything that you can think of that really surprised you on the downside that this was going to happen and it just didn't happen? Oh, in the downside, that it was going to happen and it didn't happen. We haven't had uh, one of those. Um, 
I can't think of anything. Um, yeah, I think on that on this one, I'm stumped. Okay, well that's fine. Well, that's that's probably a happy circumstance for you then. <laughs> whether whether you just can't remember it or or it's I'll actually true one. either way either way it's yeah. a good thing you're living I'll in a good state one. i'll tell you one that may be somewhat controversial but hey this is okay, the sure. this is your show uh sure. so so ho hopefully i can get a little controversial one of the things one of one of the bets uh the reason i joined Azumi is i i had seen um convergence before um mm -hmm. i we you know theoretically we all lived through the telephony convergence Mm -hmm. um personally i have scars from living the storage networking convergence i used to work at a company called mcdata that was the leader in storage networking and through convergence that market got destroyed and disappeared mm -hmm. today you can't find an independent vendor of, of you know storage networking gear or storage <laughs> they're not independent anymore mm -hmm. so convergence is an incredible force incredible so I was looking for my next gig to be in Convergence, and here we go, ITOT yeah. Convergence. It's been a fantastic movie. Our strategy and the, and the parallels are incredible. Um, we bet early on, and if you look at Nozomi and Nozomi's strategy, on on where the puck is going to be. And, and it may mm -hmm. take a decade to for the puck to get there, but if you look at who are some of our first partners, there were IT vendors, right? There was IBM, Accenture, FireEye. Um, you know, this this market, um, the, all security markets eventually um, go to the CISO, CIO, CISO, and, and have CISO, CIO expertise. And, mm -hmm. and we totally respect um, where, where OT is today and, and where, where it comes from. Uh, but convergence is a one-way street. It has a single direction. Um, OT makes it... Um, uh, to go at a different pace for for the right reasons, uh, the criticality and and the the systems um, that we deal with are you know more critical, so we have to go slower. They also have you know a different nature. They're more of a capital expense orientation. They're bigger. They're you know plants and mm -hmm. furnaces, all, all this good stuff. Um, but but the 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 path is a path that many other industries have walked before. Mm. Okay. Well, let's let's shift to the future a little bit, although that was some future right there. Uh, I've noticed, and you mentioned it, so you, Nozomi, you have your SaaS offering. You have Vantage that, that you've really been promoting this year. You have your MSSP partners. You announced your five elite partners, uh, I think, this summer, and you've been partnered with them for a while, but I think it, the program changed a little, or at least the marketing of it. And then you've got your traditional on-prem solution that you would sell directly to an asset owner. Mm -hmm. I, and this is something I've really been trying to figure out. Now, of course, those are all going to still exist in three years. I doubt mm -hmm. any of them will completely go away. But what do you think in terms of percentage the market is going to look like in three years? between SaaS, MSSP, or on-prem? And if there's another category I'm not including, feel free to add that in. So with any prediction, I have to remind myself and maybe the, your audience here that none of us could have predicted the last 18 months. Of course. Um, or even the last six months, because I think I think the last 18 months refers to, to COVID and the pandemic, but the last six months really refers to the, the attacks and, and the tone and the how elevated the conversation has sure. become in, in the government and, and so forth. So when you've had so much, um, uh, what's the right word, um, variability or volatility um, in the just very recent past, it makes you a little shy when it comes to predicting the future. Oh, of course. But, but listen, I think uh, I think there, there are a couple of, of realities out there. Uh, we have a shortage of of, of just generic cybersecurity skills. It, you know that gets amplified when it comes to OT security. You know, if we put a lot of people to work, we, we could not birth enough people to to be ready for the needs out there. So um, centralization, um, aggregation, and leverage of of cybersecurity professionals towards the available opportunities out there is what is pushing the MSSP offerings to you know to to be real and material and and mm -hmm. uh, adopted 
Um, I, I don't think it's going to be that fast. I, I think MSS. I think we will follow more of like the IT model. Um, and, and MSSPs need to mature. They need to get better at it. Customers have to trust it. Um, but it's for it's you know to your point, it's for real. It's here to stay. Um, I think you said cloud and and on premise. Um, as you know, well, we think of industrial control networks for the next good many years. I'm almost saying a decade. They're always going to have an on-premise component, whether they're in the cloud or not. So, our Vantage offering has has the main component in the cloud, but you still have sensors on-premise. So, I'm not sure that I would call it on-premise. I would call it maybe you know traditional and and then cloud leveraged. Uh, uh, and I I would separate it that way because some folks are still very hesitant on on using cloud. But the last 18 months have significantly accelerated digital transformation and adoption of um, cloud style solutions. So we've seen a very important change in our customers stance towards the cloud uh, from, you know, I'll kick you out of the room to, yeah, let's include that in the POC. So mm. um, very, very pleased. N nobody's pleased about a, a pandemic or the consequences of a pandemic, but the pandemic has had um, some impact into uh, accelerating uh, cloud style offerings. Mm. Okay. Uh, kind of related to that. Uh, one of the things that I really enjoy, I get a couple of these a year, are these projects where I get to participate in RFPs and sometimes, you know, RFPs related to the product category you're in. And I, I find it fascinating because I like working with asset owners and seeing them oftentimes come up with different, different answers. Trust me, we same. don't. We know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm sure if, if it was someone else and then they picked yours a second time, you'd love it. But it's, it's funny that way that you know, even though the, oftentimes the same questions are asked, the same answers are provided, people uh, people will come up with different decisions as to what's right for them, mm -hmm. whether it's GUI or, or who the sales team was or the presentation or such. But one of the things that I noticed in these RFPs is a number of the companies seem to be trying to involve channels, especially when it comes to installation and ongoing support of the system. And COVID has, has affected me like you. I haven't been out at sites as much during the past couple of years. So things might have changed in 2020 and 2021. But in, in 2019, I know that a lot of the channels and asset owner I was working with was getting pushed to really weren't ready for it. They had, they had been trained up on the vendor's products, whoever they were representing. But they had very little practical experience. They weren't using it day to day. They weren't hands on. It wasn't something that the asset owner could really feel comfortable that these people should support them. And channels are hard. I mean, I, I've, I've been involved in channels in the banking security area. It's really tough to get a channel up to speed and working. Do you think in, in 2021, do you think you have any channels that are, are, are strong channels? And, and when do you see it actually moving from direct to channels, if ever, in this space? Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe coming at this answer from a completely different uh, set of uh, data points. Sure. Um, you know, so me, I, I believe uh, mature enterprise B2B companies that, that are channel friendly, um, they need to, and those that declare that they're channel first, which is, which is a, a, a common occurrence sure. um, at, at a peak uh, at most can declare uh, 80%. 80% is it's, it's a good kind of best in class metric. I think mm -hmm. it's really hard to be above 80% uh, channel fulfilled um, because there are large customers that will demand uh, that you have mm -hmm. a direct relationship with them. Um, I'm very proud to say that Nozomi has uh, reached this steady state uh, in 2020, and we continue that trend in 2021. 80% of our business uh, is fulfilled through the channel. We're extremely proud of that. We're a channel-first company, and uh, and we have made a practice of of recruiting great channel, um, training and enabling a great channel, and and having our business run through the channel so of course we have direct influence at all points in time we you know our market is competitive and, and we have to um have that direct influence but um channel has been part of our dna from day one i think when you look 
well, this is one of the, I, we, we feel very proud about a few items, a few aspects of, of Nosomi and our, our partner, um, our partner set is one of uh, our, our strong suits. So are you just, when you have that 80% number, are you just running the sales through the channel or are they the people actually, when a customer sends out an RFP, you say, okay, this goes to this channel, or is this something that, that Nozomi still does the selling and then brings in the channel at the right point in time? When you look at an RFP, um, we, 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 the first thing that we do is we find out which one of our partners is responding to this RFP and, and we try to influence their decision towards Nozomi. Oftentimes, uh, more than one channel partner is responding with Nozomi. We, we obviously help them the same. We do have a deal registration process that, that uh, mm -hmm. addresses any uh, channel issues. Um, we find, we find that we, we are rarely now, you know, we're talking 2020, late 2020 and, and mm -hmm. 2021, we don't find ourselves in a position when we find an RFP and, and we don't know who else is bidding on it. And, and we need to look for a partner to bid on this RFP. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore. Okay. Uh, shifting a little bit on the competitive landscape. I, I think I was guilty of this probably the last six to 12 months of really focusing on the pure plays like yourself. And, and I, what you said earlier, I, I think you're right. There's clearly three um, that are head and shoulders above the rest. You know, for a while there, I thought it was just two, but I think clarity with their raise at least moves themselves up to consideration in the top three. But what are you thinking about the others that aren't pure plays? I mean, what do you think the future is? Do you worry about a Cisco, a Forescout, a Tenable, maybe even a Microsoft? Do you think they're uh, significant competitors in this space? Well, um, I, I thought you were coming at, at this question from a different angle. Um, th there are a lot of folks that, that say, you know, I do X, Y, Z and mm -hmm. OT security. Anybody that says those words doesn't do OT security and it's just, you know, it's it, changing a PowerPoint and changing your website is super easy. Truly addressing a, a problem with your products is super hard. So, mm -hmm. so I think the, the bucket of players that said, yes, we do X, Y, Z and OT security. I think the market already understands that, that they don't do OT security. Um, you're now talking about the set of folks that enter our market via acquisition. I'll say something, first of all, really, really positive. It okay. proves the point, you know, the, the, the horse is, 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 is dead, be dead, um, that, that to enter this market, you really need to be a specialist. You can't just take a product and grow it, or you can't have a business in IT security and all of a sudden put a couple of engineers and and build a product that now also does OT and this is your 14th product. That's an interesting point just to stop there. I mean, so that would say, and, and I would say that my experience in the market would agree with that. That's saying like a checkpoint or a Palo Alto or someone like that who says, I'm going to add OT features to my existing product or a dark trace or something like that. They have not been, they all try successful in the market, you know, but whether it's a product of them, 100% of them tried. Yeah. Yeah. They, they have all tried. And so that's, I think that's a, I'd have to agree with you there. We have not, whether it's a product problem, a marketing problem, all of the above something else, they, we don't really have a, a success story moving in that direction. So sorry to interrupt your train of thought there, but I thought that was really an interesting point. Yeah. 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 Um, and so the ones that have entered by acquisition, we also have a few data points um, that when the acquisition, I'm, I, I'm, I'm here to talk about Nozomi, right? So I don't think we, I should, you know, bring any other names. But as a market trend, I would say we have seen that very decent products um, have gotten acquired mm -hmm. and, and we haven't seen them after the acquisition. It just, just uh, I, I think the... I have a philosophy about acquisitions. My philosophy is you either acquire a technology and, you, and if you acquire a technology, you are responsible for building and investing like a VC in, in the go to market and finish the technology to make it successful. And I don't think big companies are good at that. So, so 
uh, you know, like outside of our market, you know, when Cisco bought Ironport, for example, um, versus Cisco acquiring source, source fire, it, it, you know, those are two points that, that prove my thesis, which mm -hmm. I'm sure we can find two points that disprove it. But, um, you know, if you buy a technology, you need to invest like a VC and, and companies, corporates, uh, when you put a technology inside of a PL, you can't, they don't look at it as a VC. They actually try to take money away from it. I'll take your resources out if you're not producing revenue. And guess what? A startup is not producing enough revenue to, to substantiate or justify the investment required going forward. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the case of acquiring a technology or you acquire a business. And, and I think corporations have to be very clear as to what they're doing. Are they buying a technology and therefore you need to continue to invest beyond what would seem normal to you? Um, because these startups competitors have VCs that are investing that way. Sure. Or you buy a business that is already a business, like Cisco buying Sourcefire, extremely successful. Um, and obviously all the acquisitions in OT security happen in a, at a very early stage, which it's very normal. Acquisitions happen uh, mm -hmm. you know, as a cluster at the beginning when the, kind of the, the, the non-leaders are being identified. And then at the end, when when maybe some of the leaders uh, also get acquired. Um, so cluster at the beginning, cluster at the end. So I believe the cluster at the beginning has already happened. Um, and and very few acquirers acquired a technology with the mindset of I'm acquiring a technology. And therefore, I need to continue to invest in both building great products and selling great products. Hmm. Did that make sense? I it, it does. I, I like the way you broke that down. I, I'd almost break it down, though, the technology. I'd almost split it in two, where I think there's been some, I think Microsoft's a good example, where they want a component of the underlying technology. I've asserted that they had very little interest in in selling hardware appliances that go out <laughs> in the OT level two and level one. I just don't see that them caring about that business, but they care a lot about Azure and supporting uh, cloud-based applications and services and buying all that, uh, let's see, all, all that protocol awareness and maybe even the team of engineers and such. So I, I see what the technology buy. Yes, I, I'd agree with you completely if they're saying, we're going to buy this product. I'd say it almost product. We're going to buy this product. You better be prepared to invest in it. And we haven't seen that. But I, I do think we've seen some technology acquisitions and we might see some more. Where they That's don't right. really even care if the product goes away, but this core element of the technology, they need it, and it's just easier to buy it at a discount price. That's right, and and you're right. There's a lot of things that are uh, at a discount right now. One of yeah. one of the things that are we're extremely extremely proud of is when we enter the space, as you know, as as any n normal early stage space, there were a lot of competitors back in two thousand between two thousand thirteen and two thousand sixteen. <laughs> we could have credibly named 12 players. And I think if you, if you order them, Nozomi was probably last. Hmm. And, and the fact that we went from last to, let's call us a top three, I think we're much better than top three. But for this podcast, let's, let's call it top three. Um, it's something that we're extremely proud of. Well, and I'd even say in 2018, I think I had 30 on my list and I was getting people sending me you know, hey, you miss this one, you miss that one. So it was a very, uh, you know, a very crowded field. Uh, we So we've looked direct. We've looked at these people that have acquired. But one other area that's, I think, worth considering, and, and this is probably more of a long-term issue, and, and it hits with this ITOT convergence question, mm -hmm. is your, your Splunks, your ServiceNows, your Q radars. So we've seen uh, Splunk and ServiceNow actually put a stake in the ground. They've done, uh, I think Splunk calls there's an OT add-on. I can't remember what ServiceNow calls there's, but the idea of, hey, we're going to bring more of this information into our system from products like yours. And I know you have applications and interfaces to send them that information. That's right. And so we'll be able to show this on their screen, on, on the Splunk screen, because we've even had we've even had asset owners say, hey, we want to look at that screen. We don't want to look at you know, go from here and then look at this and look at this. How do you deal with that? Do you, do you feel like, because if, if all they're doing is looking at Splunk and service now, then that would devalue the benefit 
of looking at your GUI because they're no. saying we don't want to. Do you see them always having like, okay, we've got our, our main one. And then when I get to level two or three, I, I shift over to your product or do you see them converging? Uh, that's a really, really good question. Um, this is a great opportunity for me to talk a little bit about uh, our two co-founders. Andrea and Moreno, they, they, Andrea and Moreno have incredible vision. And, and, and part of the, the product vision here is extreme openness. I, I believe that one of the things we, we brag about all the time is that the number of APIs and the number of connections we have with, with every vendor. Uh, mm -hmm. Connecting to Sims was, was a first product requirement. We do, did not ship a product that did not connect to a, to a SIM. And we connected mm -hmm. to four SIMs at the very beginning. Um, ArcSight, Splunk, Curator, um, and a few others. Um, the we've only increased the amount of of, uh, of openness since then, and and I guess where where in wherever it makes sense to invest in an application like Splunk, or in, or invest in an application like ServiceNow, we do invest in it. Uh, I do believe that um, this the cybersecurity monitoring is it needs to be aggregated in a single place. Um, you know, people invest multi million dollars into their fancy uh, socks uh, and they put security operation centers and they put all the technology there. The SIM is there. So it would be silly not to aggregate OT security there. That's where the run books are. Um, that's where the alerts and the monitoring and, mm -hmm. and the, the tickets get issued from. So, you know, we like to say that cybersecurity is a team sport. We, we absolutely have to be a team player. We have to be open. We do believe and we're convinced that OT is very specialized. Um, mm. So we cannot not have the analytical tools, the visualization tools um, in our GUI, because eventually if the issue is truly an OT issue, they're going to come to look at it in our GUI. But the alerts, the, the, the automated piece, the things that can get automated, you know, waking up people, alerting people, the beginning of a run book, um, the preparation, uh, incident response starts from the SOC. Uh, and and starts with the run book and we have to be integrated there but eventually if it's truly um and it may be an ot issue that is combined with an it issue right usually attacks have multiple um you know there are multiple points of attack um mm -hmm. you know back in the day nobody attacked you know an application from one side without a ddos happening on the other side right so i think i think the integration to sock tools is is a plus for us um it's it's it, it was a, a a win in terms of a strategic play that we ran and it's going to continue to play going forward okay well i've kind of taken us around the the market the landscape and such um as you said you're there to talk about nozomi and, and what nozomi does uh maybe to to close out is there some something we should be talking about something that our listeners and viewers need to see related to you know some major effort nozomi is doing or, or something that's important to the market that you feel we haven't talked about here i think we talked about about vantage i think i think vantage our cloud SaaS offering is is where we're putting a lot of our investment dollars and, and weight on we're, mm -hmm. we're never um um abandoning or leaving behind the, the full on-premise uh, solution um, but we are putting a lot of investment in the cloud. There are a lot of advantages to being in the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, so for folks that have cloud hesitation, um, that, you know, just my ask would be, you know, evaluate what, why is that hesitation there? The clouds are now really mature. Encryption and, and, and all sorts of protections around using the cloud are, are, are there. Your networks are not air-gapped. Your networks... Um, you know, it may have best in class products, but the clouds live. It is existential for them to have um, best class operations and, and products and availability. Um, so listen, it is it is where the puck is going to be. The, the sooner mm -hmm. we get comfortable with it, the better. No, I, I'd agree with you on that. And I almost wonder if you are you seeing any, you know, in the early days, are you seeing any people that were, were anti-cloud or let's say not willing to consider cloud, but then they dealt with it on their own network and said, this is, this is a heck of a lot of work. I'd rather just try letting someone else do that. Do you have any stories of, or examples of customers that were on-prem that have said, you know, really cloud's the way we should be going? I think, uh, 
you know, one, one of the things that we do a lot internally is characterize industries, right? And, and mm-hmm. I think w- one of the ways in which you would characterize industries is, you know, how, how OT really are they, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I would say, and again, without, you know, defining it too well here, but you could yeah. say, well, listen, manufacturing has always been, you know, they not always segmented their networks as hard as maybe other pl- players. Mm-hmm. So they may, they may more like IT, even though it's still OT, while an oil and gas, a water company, or or a utility, um, it's a lot more OT um, than than not than IT. Um, and and in that, if you allow my, that vaguely described spectrum, our expectation was okay. Then the ones that are more like OT are going to be more cloud friend uh, cloud friendly. And, and I think that that's true in general. But when we launched Vantage, which we gave an early release back in, in November of 2020, the first two people that raised their hand and they adopted and, and we, we actually got our first two purchase orders um, in Q4 last year before it was generally available mm-hmm. um, were a water utility company and an electric utility company, which was mm-hmm. completely shocking for us, completely shocking. Um now, now that we've had a lot more experience, um, the the tr- the trend is starting to normalize to our original assumptions. But, um, like I said, uh, this this pandemic and the new series of of attacks and the relevancy that our topics have gotten have dramatically accelerating um, this market. And we should not rely on the perceptions that may be eighteen months old because the world has changed. I think that's true. And also, I think you might have hit some people that were more mature. You know, when when you look at some of the ones that you would think would be more reluctant to move to this way, they also might have cared about security for longer. And it, almost the initial reaction we see with new sectors and new asset owners in those sectors is in, originally they're telling you why things won't work. And then eventually they try something, it works, and they try something else and it works, and they get a little bit more willing to understand that this closed world they thought of wasn't there. So I, I it's tough to measure maturity, but I, if I was to ask for a metric across the industry in terms of adoption, I'd, I'd want that maturity um, measurement because I think that really is probably, to me, almost more than sectors, is how mature is the organization in dealing with IT and OT convergence and and technologies, and then are they ready to make the jump to the cloud? Yeah. But, but right. it, it's great to hear that it's going. And um, I really appreciate your time and and taking the stroll through the market with me. Congratulations to you and the team there on your raise. And and as you know, I'll be watching closely because I, I find this market fascinating. I hope uh, I hope I've earned a, a second invitation at some point. Thank you for <laughs> having me, and uh, and uh, we'll see you around. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.